if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I hate flying. Now, I'm not scared of flying at all. I just get really queasy. And I tried taking those little uh, anti-nausea pills, but they made me really zombie-like and a bit kind of space cadet, which is great when you're on the plane, but the moment you leave, not so good. I, uh, on two occasions, I managed to leave the airport with my bags off the conveyor belt. I got rid of those pills. And then I think because I'm a bit of a nervy flyer, I'm not always paying attention to the things I should be. The other day I uh, got on the plane and I went up to row eight only to realize my boarding pass said gate eight, row 21. Ah. Had to turn around and try and make my way back down the aisle as everybody's coming on. And I found myself in that kind of game of human Tetris. Hi, sorry, gate eight, row eight, awkward. So the thing is I hate flying, but I love traveling. I just love going to different countries, meeting different people, seeing different types of cultures, hearing different languages. And it's one of the reasons I love working for the New Zealand Red Cross, because part of my role is to resettle refugees here in Hamilton. And so I've met people from the Congo, from Afghanistan, from Somalia, from Colombia, from all over the world. And it kind of feels like the world has come to me. And it's a bit like going on an OE, but without ever having to get on a plane. Now, I love cultural diversity, but I'm also really aware that in cultural diversity, it's so easy to have misunderstandings, eh? My favorite saying is, if you disagree with someone, walk a mile in his shoes. And then, if at the end of that mile, you still disagree with him, well, you're a mile away from him, and you have his shoes. <laughs> I love everything, uh, you know, about diversity. But I've also come to learn, as any of you have had multicultural experiences, that there's so many things that we can point out across cultures that are the same as well. I have a friend uh, who's a Somali Kiwi, and his mum recently passed away back in Somalia. And as he was telling me what they were going to be doing as a family, there were so many things culturally that was going to be different, you know, regarding the funeral and that. But then he started telling me about just the experience that the family was going through in terms of grieving and, and how they were having to make decisions together and how difficult it was. And I could totally relate to that. And I told him that. And he said to me, I'm so glad you understand. You know, he said, we're having so much trouble trying to agree as a family on what to do with mum's house, what to do with her possessions. And then he said, no idea what we're going to do with the camel. <laughs> and at that point, my ability to relate kind of came to an end, you know? And I didn't know what to say. I was like, yeah, we didn't know what to do with the um, Suzuki Swift. <laughs> but it's those differences in life that just make things fun and interesting, eh? And at the end of it, we can absolutely have those similarities and we understand each other when it comes to those big things about love, about grief, about family dynamics. That's our shared humanity, get those same understandings. Now, coincidentally, uh, today is actually World Refugee Day. And the United Nations tells us that today, there is currently 50 million people who have been forced from their homes due to conflict. 50 million people. To put that into context, that is more people today who have had to flee their homes than there was at the end of World War II. That is a humanitarian disaster. And it is why there's a lot of people calling currently for the government to increase the number of refugees we resettle in New Zealand. Now, New Zealand accepts around about 750 people each year as part of the refugee quota program. It's part of our commitment to international humanitarian care. It's not immigration, it's humanitarian aid. I'll never forget this one woman who arrived through the refugee quota. She was originally from Somalia, and she had 10 beautiful little kitties. And on arrival day, uh, we welcomed her. And the first thing she said to me was, I've lost my son. And I said, I'm not surprised. They're everywhere. I was like, we'll find him somewhere. And she said, no, I've lost him in Somalia. He was four years old. 
I said, how long has he been missing? And she said, 18 years. And she ended up telling the story of when the conflict hit the area. They had no time to prepare or plan. They just had to run. She grabbed the baby and the four-year-old. They ran outside and people were jumping on a truck. She passed the baby up onto the truck and she stepped up to the back of it and she was holding on and people were holding on to her. And she ran down to pull up the four-year-old. But at that same moment, a shot rang out and it spooked the driver and he hit the accelerator and they took off. And because she was being held on, on the truck, she couldn't get off to get to the four-year-old. And 18 years later, the first thing she says to me is, I've lost my son. Because she had never been able to move on from that moment in the road. And today, there are 50 million people who have similar stories of running, of horrible losses. It is why at the New Zealand Red Cross, we are saying we should increase the number of refugees we accept to New Zealand because the humanitarian crisis is so significant. If we as a country have the capacity to ease that suffering in any way, if we can, we should. Now, we probably can't understand or get our heads around what 50 million people in that situation look like. But we can probably understand what it would feel like to be that mum on that truck and why it is such a great thing that New Zealand offers refugees a chance to quietly rebuild their lives here in Aotearoa. Resettlement, it's just about giving someone a chance. A chance to have a home again. A chance to be safe. A chance to be able to send your kids to the doctor if you need to. Or as one family said to us recently, it's a chance to go to sleep at night without feeling afraid. Now, resettlement in New Zealand is not an easy thing. There's so much new things that you have to come to terms with. Everything from uh, the weather, you know, the four seasons in one day that we kind of provide here in Aotearoa, through to the ATMs, the banks, the learning a new language. There's so much people need to get their heads around. And it's often a really lonely journey. They're not doing it with their whole family or their neighborhood. Families don't often arrive intact, and they certainly don't have their whole friend network available to them when they settle here. And all these new things they're having to learn, they're doing it in the context often of grieving or still processing trauma. Now, sometimes resettlement can be funny. We had uh, the family who used their washing machine for the first time and it flooded. And it took us a while to realize that it hadn't been used to wash clothes. It had been used to wash plates and cups. But you're going to be amazed at what it does with clothes. Though. We had the family who was, uh, got stuck on the orbiter bus. You know the bus that goes around and around in Hamilton? And they called their volunteers to say, they're on a really long bus trip. <laughs> but they still just hadn't found their stop yet. There was a family uh, recently who arrived and they said to their volunteers, we keep missing the magic person who's putting things in the box at the front of our house. <laughs> I just love the fact that somewhere out there, there's a postie going about his or her job, having no idea that they're creating a little bit of magic in someone else's day. You know? Somebody once said to me, what does a good day look like for you at work? For me, it's arrival day. It's when we welcome the families, we show them where they're going to live. It's that moment where when you consider that the average time in a refugee camp is currently 17 years, getting to be there on the day that someone's life's changed, that's magic, eh? That's what we love. Now, working for the Red Cross, one of the things we do is resettle refugees in the community. And we have this amazing team 
of volunteers and staff who do this day in and day out. And there's something we've learnt. It's that there is an element of magic when it comes to resettlement. Now, sometimes it can just look like coincidence or really good timing. The other, a while ago, we had a family um, who was at home, was really cold, couldn't afford firewood, but they had a fireplace. And we were talking in the office about how we could fix this. And the phone rang, and it was somebody offering us a free load of firewood wherever we wanted it delivered. It's like, wow, amazing time. And then the social worker said to me, but you know what, we really need a fire guard because they've got two little kitties, you know? And suddenly there's a knock on the door and a woman walks in with a box of donated games and toys and then she adds, hey, I don't know if you need it or not, but I've got an extra fire guard in the car. Is that any use to you? And I just remember standing there going, that did not just happen, you know? Sometimes the magic occurs when there's just these connections that are made between people. We had this one volunteer who was uh, fanatical about rock climbing. Just absolutely loved it. We matched them with a particular family. And then months later, we found out that the teenage kid in this family, the only thing he had wanted to do, his one dream when he was in the refugee camp was if he ever made it to another country, he wanted to learn to rock climb. And you're just like, man, how did that happen? Because if we had known, we would have made that connection happen. But the thing is, we didn't know, and it happened anyway. And that's the magic of resettlement. When we often see, more times than not, the magic of resettlement happens across the neighbor's fence. It's those interactions or those connections that happen in the community. We've heard stories of amazing connections across the neighbor's fence, standing in the post shop line of all places. And you just find yourself going, how did that happen? The thing with all these magic moments is you can't ever replicate them. You can't plan for them. But they kind of hold resettlement together because we can do the humanitarian aid part. We can plan for that. That's, that's fine. That's easy. But you can't plan for these magic moments. And in those moments where we ask ourselves, how did that happen? It's a bit like trying to peer behind a magic curtain, you know? Like, what was behind that? How did that come about? And it's a bit like the party in the letterbox. When you peer behind the curtain, it turns out that actually, it's not magic at all. There's just something really normal happening, eh? And when it comes to the magic of resettlement, when we try and peer behind the curtain, what we often find is it's something really normal happening as well. It's just that somebody offered a hand of friendship, or was really generous, or showed compassion or kindness to somebody who was new to New Zealand. But it's all these magic moments that kind of wrap and hold the resettlement experience together. And it's these magic moments that contribute to the one thing that we're constantly searching for, which is how do we create the feeling of belonging? Because for someone who's new to New Zealand, if they feel like, yes, this is my place, this is where I belong, I'm welcome here, it, it creates a sense of belonging. And when people feel like they belong here, then they settle better. And if they settle better, then they contribute to our community in really meaningful ways. So it's something we want to happen, both for their sake and our sake. The problem is, you can't force somebody to feel like they belong, you know? You can't, you can't make this happen. You can only create the environment, I guess, to try and nurture it. So, one thing uh, we did was we implemented a pulfiti on the day that families arrive. And this was a project we did with the New Zealand Police, um, Tarunanga o Kirikiriroa, and the Waikato Refugee Forum. So if you can imagine in your minds, families arriving on the bus, they step off their first step on Hamilton soil and they go straight into a pulfiti. Now, hopefully you have been to a pulfiti before a traditional Māori welcome. But I bet you've never been to a pulfiti like one of ours. We can have four different languages going at a time. Now, as you can imagine, not a lot of people are up to speed with all the protocols on day one in Hamilton. 
So we have people standing in the wrong place, speaking at the wrong time. We have uh, the standing up, sitting down, all in the wrong order. And don't even get me started uh, on the hongi. <laughs> Trying to explain to people uh, when to touch noses and foreheads and all in a line. Utter chaos every time. But there's something beautiful that happens. The wairua, or the spirit of what we're trying to do, comes through. And regardless of language, people understand that they are being treated with great respect, that they are being highly valued, that they are being told that you are welcome, that you belong here. And after running, and after being told you're illegal, to be told that you are now welcome here, and that this is now your land too, that is something amazing. Hamilton is actually the only place in New Zealand that welcomes refugees on day one with a pōpere. And as much as we want to see more refugees arrive in New Zealand, I would say we don't just want to accept more refugees into our community. We want to welcome more refugees into our community. We are so much better off as a community because we have former refugees resettled here. They bring their cultural diversity, they bring their skills, their knowledge, their experience, and they bring a passion for New Zealand because it's the place that gave them safety. Now, this is uh, what you are part of as a Hamiltonian community, having former refugees resettled here. Now, you may not be one of the uh, New Zealand Red Cross volunteers who are setting up the houses or taking the kids to school on their first day, but you are the neighbour. You are the community member. You are the employer. <laughs> one of you may even be the postie. Because when I say to people, when did you feel like you first belonged in New Zealand? They'll often say things like, it was the first time my neighbour invited me over for dinner. It was the first time I got a job in New Zealand. Or, quite often, it's the first time I went for a rugby game. <laughs> and this sense of belonging, to make this happen, we need both the formal welcome of the kōwhiri, and the informal welcome in the community to make this work. And when it works, it's humanitarian aid with a little bit of magic thrown. Now, this is a picture of a door in my office. And as you can see, it's not a very good door because it's leaning against a wall. But it used to be a good door in another building. And when we moved, we had to, um, well, we stole it, but don't worry about that. And now it just leans against a wall in my, in my office. But on arrival day, families, they write their name and the date on it as a way of recognizing the day their new life started in New Zealand. And about a year after the woman from the truck with the 10 little kitties, about a year after she wrote her name on that door, she came to see at me at my office. And she told me her son had been found, that he was alive, and that they'd spoken on the phone. It turns out that in the chaos, in the fighting, in the running, another family who was running saw this little four-year-old by himself, and they picked him up and they took him with them. But they ran in a different direction. They crossed a different international border, and they ended up in a different refugee camp. And it took 18 years for that area to be safe enough to return to again. 18 years for him to be old enough to return. And because New Zealand had given his mum a safe place to live, because she was no longer moving from refugee camp to refugee camp. When he made it back to the area, people were able to tell him where his family was. 
and they were able to, to connect. We took a little bit of tape and we put it on the door right underneath her name and we wrote reserve and we put his picture next to it. And it took four very long, long years but eventually one day he arrived in New Zealand and joined his family. And I'll tell you what, I'll always remember that day at work when I went to visit them at their house and I met him for the first time. And I told him how we had seen how his mother had never stopped looking for him and how we had reserved a little spot in Aotearoa just for him because this is where he belonged now. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't just a good day at work. That was a bloody great day. 